Alrighty, welcome everyone to um, this webinar, Finding a Home for Your Story Online. Um, this is the third webinar in a series of four. Just as a reminder, all webinars are being recorded, so if you are unable to follow the entire webinar today or you want to listen back to it later, um, we do record them and make sure they're available for re-listening later on. Particularly in this webinar as well, we make a number of references to some websites and some other options and we will do our best sharing uh, some of that information in a handy handout post webinar that we will be we or Shannon or someone will be sharing with you just to have clickable links because since you're sharing our screen that may be a little tricky we're continuing to talk about cultural storytelling done interviews you have you have some raw content and now what's next my name is Selwyn Rem. I am the project director for MuseWeb. We are working on this together with the Museum on Main Street team here at the Smithsonian. And my colleague who you just heard is Heather Shelton. Uh, she is our digital curator. And when it really comes down to what to do with all this content, uh, she truly is our, uh, our expert in this. Um, so I think you'll be hearing a lot more from her than from me. Sure. Well, like Selwyn mentioned, my name is Heather Shelton, and I'm the digital curator for the Muse Web Foundation. And we have done a tremendous amount of research in the last couple of months on places for you to put your completed story collection for the YAG projects. And we know that your students are going to be um, working very hard to collect numerous incredible stories about local community history and about all, all kinds of various topics. And the real question is, at the end of the day, who hears those stories? Where are you going to put those stories? How are you going to make sure that they're preserved uh, for future generations? And that's really the task of curators and archivists, right? But for this particular project, the quality of the content that we've been seeing uh, coming out of these youth access grants really does merit long-term archiving. And we have found that a lot of the students are posting their content to YouTube and they're posting it to various sites where millions of people worldwide have access to these local stories. So not only are you essentially giving the students a forum for reaching global audiences, but you're helping to ensure that those stories are used in the future. We were at the point where we've collected all these this research and stories or your students are still working on them. And then now what do I do with it? So that's really always the million dollar question. A lot of great oral histories and cultural stories are being recorded and done. Um, but there is always the question of how do we keep going forward and how do we make sure it makes sense that what we do doesn't get lost in the past. Then we go on to the next steps, and Heather, if, if you will, you want to take it over from here? So the biggest question you have to determine when you're working with your students to create the, the content that's going online is what, what's the format that your story fits in most naturally? You may have an idea, or your students may have an idea before they finalize the content if they wish to create audio content, an audio story, or podcast, or perhaps they're looking to do a documentary film or short film for YouTube. So the way they have collected and managed the content up to this stage will really determine the final out, the outcome or product um, for the story. So if uh, your students are more comfortable working with visuals, perhaps video is the, the better outcome. Or maybe they're using their smartphone to do most of the recording. And in that case, maybe it's audio. Or maybe they've collected so much research that a slide presentation or a, a, a formal website is in the mix for the creation or the, the final product for their story. So keep this in mind even before the research happens, because if you plan on creating video in particular, you're going to need to spend extra time um, working with visuals, because obviously the visual scenery, the B-roll, and everything that you use to collect to sort of fill in the gaps of the storytelling of the video is going to be critical in producing that final product. Think about where you're headed before you even begin. And in this case, if you are planning on doing video um, or audio, you have to think about that supporting imagery. Where are you going to get the extra sounds? 
the background music, the, the, the short clips of um, a bell ringing or whatever those sound bites are that you might happen to, to want to include. Are you going to record those or is there an opportunity for you to find those online? And that's where we'd like to talk a little bit about something that's really critical to a lot of storytelling, particularly if you'd like to pull things, quote unquote, off the shelf to supplement your story, and that is called Creative Commons content. What is Creative Commons? Creative Commons is actually a method by which you can legally share your knowledge and creativity to build a more accessible and innovative world. What does that really mean? It really means that you can use somebody else's photographs or perhaps you can use their audio clips or their video montage and you can reuse that to build something that's completely your own. So it's like sharing content and it's really the best thing that has happened to the internet for anybody who's producing content on their own. What it means is that in many cases, in most cases, you can download someone else's content for free, whether that is an image or an audio clip or even video files, and use those and incorporate those into a totally new product. So that is called Creative Commons, and we're going to go into that just a little bit more. It'll, it easily allows you to sort of understand what you're getting into, and if anybody is familiar with the nuances of copyright law, it really is complicated. So for Creative Commons, it's, it's boiled down to the most basic elements. Can you share this um, content um, with a specific license? And that license might be the fact that you just have to attribute it to somebody. You have to cite the photographer or the, film, the filmographer, whoever that happens to be. There are other licenses that relate to commercial use or whether or not that particular item has been modified. They're all very easy to understand and those Creative Commons licenses are written in a way that just about anybody can sort of get the gist of how they're supposed to cite those sources. But Creative Commons content can come in the form of images, like with Flickr, which is one of the better Creative Commons websites out there. Uh, it can be video or it can be audio. And I find that for me personally, doing social media and media production, I get a tremendous amount of supplemental imagery from Flickr. So you can go to Flickr Creative Commons and you can choose a license that best suits your project, whether it's just an, an attribution or it's an attribution non-commercial usage. And for your purposes, if you're working with students, you probably can choose any of those licenses as long as you're not trying to monetize the content that will be produced from uh, the student um, videographers or our um, content creators. So a couple of other great sources of Creative Commons content. Uh, Wikimedia, everyone in the world has heard of Wikipedia, but Wikimedia um, is actually sort of the media arm of Wikipedia. And the goal of Wikimedia Commons is, is ultimately to produce hundreds of thousands or even millions of free assets for people to use and um, recast in whatever light they choose to. So you'll find audio, video, um, a wealth of imagery from all across the globe. And what you see on that screenshot is an image that somebody took of, um, of Monticello. So if you're looking for historical images or you're looking for something that maybe is just a, a field in Minnesota or you're looking for a particular historical reference, this is a great place to find imagery of historic sites. So a great place to search and those Creative Commons licenses are very clearly marked um, in the image field so you know exactly how to cite those images. And on the right, what we find uh, is a, is a, it looks like a slide for Flickr, but we're talking a little bit about Vimeo, which Vimeo is actually sort of a competitor to YouTube. It's a, uh, a video sharing site which ultimately behaves like YouTube but allows for a lot of Creative Commons uploads, which means if you're looking for um, supplemental video of a bird flying or you're looking for video of a car going down the interstate, it's a great place to find that ancillary content that you can use to bolster 
a video that someone is creating about more specific elements in your community. So both of these, whether you're talking about Creative Commons on Wikimedia or Vimeo, are fantastic sources for free, uh, free content that students can use in their videos and in their podcasts. And actually, I just quickly want to mention, since we're looking here at the, at the Flickr image anyway, the Creative Commons li uh, licenses, they're, they're presented in a way that is very inviting, that very clearly a, a slash through a dollar sign, you don't need to think about using, seeing those icons. It's very quickly understandable what you can do with the images that you find under this kind of shared licensing um, option. And it's, it's, it's really um, not meant to get bogged down in, in the specific licenses but it's tried to, uh, to simplify and, and clarify um, using one kind of standard. And I th we, we wanted to spend some time on Creative Commons licensing, particularly because we've seen a lot of students submit projects um, and have background music of, of popular songs that might be on the radio. And while it's very enticing and very tempting to use um, pop music or to use something that's a favorite song of a student, a Taylor Swift or a, another popular artist, ultimately that's not a legal way of approaching content that's shared online. So we want to teach students the proper ways of crediting um, media sources as well as indemnifying them in the event that their video were to go viral and it would be the most popular thing on the internet, we would want them to have the building blocks of a really successful product or video out there that they could share infinitely with any, without any type of recourse. Um, so those copyright restrictions are real and they really should, you know, should pay attention to what's happening with um, multimedia use, even in a student film. And, you know, if you're looking for more historical references, if you're looking, for example, for artworks or, or something that relates to something that might be on a museum, um, there are three museums right now and, and possibly many more who are, are sharing their collections liberally online the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the New York Public Library, and the Rikes Museum all have content on their website which can be downloaded and reused even for commercial purposes. So Creative Commons extends to museum collections as well, and multiple museums have made use of the Flickr Commons, which is a little bit different, but sharing historic collections online, everything from local historical societies all the way up to the Smithsonian um, have used the commons on Flickr to share important collections that people can find in the public domain. So great resources for students who are looking for historical images, um, you know, on, in the commons or just general filler content in Flickr and Wikimedia. So uh, there are some links that are listed on these slides which are helpful for students looking for more information. Before we go on, a quick quick note. Um, if you're working with a local museum or a local historical society or you're representing one of them, um, this is something to consider for your own collection as well. Um, I don't have the exact source. I will be honest with that at the moment. But I know, for example, the Reichs Museum decided to put all their own collection on, available as Creative Commons items. And what they found is that it brought in, because it was being shared more broadly, it actually brought in a lot more visitors because people suddenly realized like, oh, that belongs to the Rikes Museum, now I want to go visit it in person. And so um, even though the direct pay wall that they used to have that people would pay for it to use an image brought in some money, um, they actually realized that visibility was tr had tremendous more value for visitors, but also for people then going back and it's like, now we do want to use a paid version of the image or a high res or something, because making it out there and available is something that is important to, to be able to share it and for people to know that it exists. And um, perhaps this is something that even the students can consider with the projects that they create. Absolutely. We've really tried to encourage student creators to make use of Creative Con Commons licensing as well. So it's not just a download, it's also an upload. So if they're uploading content to some of the sites that we'll talk about in a few slides, 
they can stipulate that they'd like their content to be Creative Commons as well. So it, it works both ways and it's an excellent way for people both to share and to reuse content that's on the internet. But speaking of Creative Commons content, there is a proper way to cite Creative Commons uh, photographs or video. And there are links included on this slide that give you a sense of, of where you can go next. If you're looking at, at um, an image, for example, from Flickr, we have sort of pulled out the, um, the proper way to cite this image. So what you would find if you were searching for an image on Flickr is you would find uh, where it says Shadowgate that that's actually the, the user's name. So a, a person called themselves Shadowgate and they called the image itself um, that particular museum. So how would you cite that? Because you need to create a credit for a final screen in a video perhaps, or maybe you want to include it in a, a text citation in a podcast note. And so what you'll see on the right side of that screen is a, a finalized or a formal credit for that particular image. And you'll notice that because we've included this online, we've actually created hot links to those particular elements that are in green. So we've created a hot link to the image itself and to the user, which is Shadowgate, as well as to the copyright license, which you see as CCBY 2.0. And there are all kinds of different versions of how you can cite a particular image. But what you'll see on the left is what we're trying to do is create a, a breadcrumb trail, essentially, so that a user can refine and, and locate this particular source just as you would in a footnote of a book or in an annotation. So you want to cite the title of the photo, the author of the, the photo, the source, which in this case is Flickr Creative Commons, and what license that particular photo was uploaded to. So you can sort of search around on the page, on the original page, but on the far right side of that image page, you'll see that there's a little text that says some rights reserved, and that's where you would click to find out information about that particular license. So if you have any slides that you print out from this particular presentation, this might be a good one uh, to do so with because it gives you a quick reference on how to cite these images um, in a text form. So once you have collected all of these resources and your students are, are really ready to start putting their story together, you really need to start making some choices. First and foremost, what software are you going to be using to do the editing? And there are so many options out there, truly. There are free examples. There are paid examples. There are examples where you need subscriptions. There are, is the top of the line, which might be something like um, a Final Cut Pro for app from Apple or perhaps a Premiere Elements from Adobe. Both of those products are extremely expensive. And so what our goal was with this, with this project was to find freeware that students could use download it to uh, even a, a, a small computer and to start editing content on the fly without having to, to have a subscription. One of the best for audio is called Audacity and another is called The Levelator. We're going to go into those a little bit more in the next two slides. But video is a little bit trickier. There are a lot of free video editors out there, some of which are good. And I won't say they're great, but some of which are good and some of which are horrible. It really just depends on sort of how you see the interface and whether or not you're ambitious enough to tinker around with all of the options that are available. Video editing is a little more difficult than audio editing, so the learning curve is a bit steeper. That's not to say that um, students can't do it very successfully. In fact, a lot of devices like iPads, for example, can come loaded with iMovie or any of the other software that might be native to a particular um, device. So there are options out there and a lot of students have really gotten good at doing video editing. But these two options that are listed here are, are two of the, I guess, easier versions of the video editors that we used. And one is a, not a free option, it's a low cost option. But Ultimately, what you want with some of this video editing software is the ability to click and drag content into a window um, editor. It makes it 
seamless and very easy and very intuitive even for a novice user. And so um, we're not going to go too deeply into video. If you guys have more questions, we'd certainly be happy to take them afterwards. But because there is, you see more of a broad variety of, of platforms on video, it's, it's hard to give you advice on one particular one. Um, and because uh, Audacity and Levelator, they do two slightly different things, but they're both free and open and have been kind of the standard within the non-professional uh, audio recording industry, I would say. I mean, that we did want to highlight them for a moment uh, because they have been around for a while. They, uh, Audacity allows for easy mixing of different audio segments into one soundtrack. It easily allows you to put some background sound behind it. Um, and all through uh, pretty much a drag and drop uh, visual. Um, Heather, you want to kind of tell you tell us what you what you were working on here? Sure. In this case, all I really did is um, add or import an audio file, which in this case was a wave file, which is a, a large um, a large file format. And I wanted to get rid of a specific section of this audio. So all I did literally was click and drag to select that grayed out area. And then you push delete and it's gone, which is wonderful. It's that easy. And when it comes time to saving the video or the audio rather, in this case, I can export the file into a different file type which the universal file type, generally speaking right now for audio, is an MP3, which is a much smaller format versus a WAV file. So in this case, it quickly and very seamlessly allows you to export as an MP3 file and upload. It's ready for upload, so it couldn't be any easier. If you're working with a limited number of files, you literally um, can edit content in a matter of minutes. The levelator is interesting because it is it does something slightly different. But if you have, for example, a presentation like Heather and me, we are talking with different voice volumes or an interviewing with an interviewee, and one is a lot louder than the other one. What the levelator can do, and this is basically the extent of the pro, uh, program, you drop again that WAV file into this little box on the right, and it will adjust the audio levels within the, the whole audio segment. So no matter who is talking, it will normalize the, um, the interviews and combined re uh, recordings a bit. So that way, when someone is listening to it, there is one consistent volume of sound, and they don't need to play around with volume increase when someone else is talking. Um, so it's, a, it's just a very small, quick program that I've, I've found very useful. Um, they've stopped the con conversations network who, who used to produce it has stopped development on it, but really it is everything you need. So as long as it keeps working, I would certainly encourage people to just do that one quick thing. If you have multiple different voices or one person who starts off really loud and then kind of ends on a soft note, to to use this to to be able to normalize their the the recording and then after that it be ready for for uploading to wherever you want to. So the big question becomes, you're finished editing. It's a beautiful, pristine, very moving product, and you, you sort of need to know, what do I do next? The big question, which platforms are most su su suited to your type of content? Thinking about accessibility. So again, um, when you're producing the content, you're ready to rock and roll and put it up there on YouTube or an, another platform, you should think about accessibility, meaning you need to create a transcript, uh, transcript to post or include subtitles in video. And again, not that this is additional work. This is creating content that's more accessible to a more uh, diverse and global audience. There are many tips out there for creating accessible audio and video. Uh, we've included some of those tips here, and you can click on that link um, once we post the, the webinar. So I wanted to include my workflow as a digital curator when I create a story and post it online. And believe it or not, although it looks complicated here, it's actually fairly quick and seamless. So I start with my raw content. I'm editing and finalizing the audio. I'm writing a transcript. And I'm searching for ancillary content, whether that is 
additional photos uh, on Flickr or music that I can back up a podcast to on SoundCloud. Making sure, of course, that the rights are Creative Commons rights and, and, and that particular content is available for use. I create my final content. So, next question, where do I post it? The number one place that I post, the first place that I post, is the Museum on Main Street website. And we're going to go into um, a, a little bit more depth about how to do that in just a few minutes. I also post to YouTube if it's video. If it's audio, I post to SoundCloud. And then I go through a series of processes depending on what type of content it is to post to one of these other platforms, perhaps Internet Archive or Wikimedia. And we always map our content on Google Maps. So it seems like a lot of work, and we, we certainly don't expect you all or even the students to go through the process of uploading to each of these platforms. But we're going to give you some ideas for why you should diversify your content in just a few minutes. But as a final step, once I've posted to those, I end up um, um, putting it out there on social media. So Twitter is our platform of choice where I create a post and then ultimately tag it with Be Here Main Street. So this is actually the truth. If you want to follow the advice of your financial planner, you should diversify. And in this case, you diversify your digital content to safeguard it just the way you would diversify your 401k or your portfolio to ensure that it's going to be around and it's going to be there to last. So in our case, we try to diversify our digital content in the event, and sometimes it's a likely event, that some of these platforms go away. And we don't anticipate that a YouTube is going to go away or that a SoundCloud is going to go away. But what happens frequently in the digital world is that platforms like this take a different form and they might decide to change the way the content is displayed or perhaps there's a nuance of a platform that no longer exists where your content may have lived. So the way to safeguard and to create longevity for content is to put it on multiple platforms and that's our strategy for ensuring the lifelong, I guess, survival of some of the stories that we've collected with the stories from Main Street and Be Here Main Street project. For your purposes, again, we don't expect you to use every single one of these platforms. But we would start with the Museum on Main Street website and then make your selections from there. If you're working in audio, really the best platform right now is SoundCloud. SoundCloud makes use of just about every form of audio content, whether it's a, a person talking or it's an oral history or maybe it's a recorded song or a sound bite. It really is the repository online for any type of sound. Um, you can upload uh, according to Creative Commons as well or you can have all rights reserved on this platform. A great platform for audio. YouTube, of course, is the go-to for video. Uh, the Pew Research Center just announced that more than 1 billion, 1 billion videos are watched every single day on YouTube. So it's the go-to source for video. It's a little bit more uh, time consuming, of course, to create video than it is to create audio. But if you choose to do video, YouTube is the place to go. And there are methods in YouTube where you can do very advanced um, tagging that allow you to not only locate your story, but also to have people retrieve it very easily. So YouTube is a top pick. Internet archives may or may not be one that you have heard of before, but there are millions of resources on Internet archives, and it is a digital library. So think about it as a library out there that houses content about an infinite number of, of topics. So if you're posting stories about water or you're posting stories about hometown teams or whatever the, the subject matter is, this is a, play, a great place to post your content that can be recorded in a way that is more like a library search. So if you're familiar with metadata and you're familiar with the ways that archives and librarians use to search and catalog items, this is a great repository for that. Other platforms to consider, Wikimedia Commons, we talked about that a little bit earlier. 
and Easy Travel, which is an app that allows you to create stories and create tours online. It all depends on the nature of your story and the type of content that you have to display. So on our blog, we rated or ranked some of these platforms that we thought were, were best of category winners. So this is sort of the, the digital superlatives of content storage. And we have a link to that particular story on the left there, but we've talked a little bit about SoundCloud, about YouTube. Clio is a great um, content management system for historic sites. So if your content that's coming out of your, your YAG projects relates perhaps to old buildings or events that relate to history in your town, this is a great site to upload your content. It's a crowdsourced website, which ultimately means that people all over the country are uploading content about various historic sites and then of, um, of locations across the country. History Pen might be one that you've heard of as well. It is similar to Clio. It's a more robust system. I believe that there are um, more um, people using that, so there's a larger audience, which means there's greater visibility. So we really noted that that one was really best for collections, and it has more of a museum connection than some of the others. Internet Archives, great for long-term um, archiving of content. The best legacy potential we're going to talk about in a few minutes is Museum on Main Street and that ability to um, upload your content to the Smithsonian and have it housed on a Smithsonian website is um, a, a sort of a bragging point, I think, and certainly for students to say that their content is on, is on the Smithsonian, housed in the Smithsonian, I think is a wonderful legacy. Best for mapping stories. You can create a map of your stories or of your content using Google My Maps. And each of these are explained more in depth by using clicking on the link that we have on the left. And you can even get a rating for um, each of these platforms, pros and cons for each of these platforms, and the type of content that's best suited for them. Some of you guys have been using uh, sections of the toolkit that we have been developing and shortly we'll be um, posting a new version of the toolkit that we've been developing together with the Museum of Main Street team online as well about story recording and, and oral and kind of what this webinar is, is an extension of and um, the suggestions and the star ratings and everything that we've been uh, looking at for platforms is also listed in one of the sections in that toolkit. Um, which can also be found on the museweb.us website, um, free downloadable. We love this website, museumonmainstreet.org. Um, the Museum on Main Street team launched their new website in November, and not only is it beautiful, but it's, um, it has such great potential for story collection. So we're going to go through a couple of the screens that take you through the process of uploading your story, which is literally as easy as one, two, three. The first thing that you need to do is to create an account. You create a login and a password, and that takes you into the portal, so to speak, where you're enabled, a, a permitted to upload content. Once you've created your login and your password and you're ready to upload your story, this is the screen that you're going to see. And it, it asks you to, to provide a few details, like your name, if you prefer the subject of your content, the time that the content took place or the time period, and the location. And we're very um, specific and very encouraged by the idea of adding location because as a, as a cultural storytelling organization, we believe that location and place-based narrative is really important in creating context for your stories. So this is one not to skip. This is one to certainly include that not only your town name but your state and any specifics you can possibly provide in any of this screen, these screens ultimately helps people not only retrieve your story more easily, but create context and legacy for the future. So once you have told us a little bit about yourself, you're going to start uploading um, details about your story. You can include a story narrative, which is a description of your story. And you can, um, in about 500 words or less, talk to us, give us an indication of what that story is, that story is about. 
And then it comes the fun part, the uploading of the content. And in this case, you can upload up to five assets. You can upload images. You can upload video files. You can upload MP3 audio files. And all of those work together to sort of create this, this final narrative that you'd like to submit to the Smithsonian. That's not to say that you have to upload all five. Perhaps you only want to upload an audio story, or maybe you're only uploading images and text. You have a variety of options that you can um, explore with the website. Once you have submitted your content, you're going to get a screen that says your story has been submitted. Thank you for your submission. And we'll be reviewing your story. The content on Stories from Main Street is moderated, which means there is a curator and an ad administrator who goes back and makes sure that that content is appropriate. Uh, for publication on a Smithsonian website. That's not to say that they're editorializing um, how good a story is or, or whether or not that uh, you know, meets Smithsonian standards. Ultimately, they're looking for you know, content that could be deemed offensive, etc. It's not uh, quality control on this. So you will ultimately receive an email that says, in this case, it was Dear Heather, thank you for your contribution. I'm pleased to inform you that your story has been reviewed, processed, and selected for publication. And you receive a link to where your story is housed on the website that you can in turn share on social media and send out to friends. So the, the, the entire process is a very quick one. And ultimately, once your story has been reviewed, um, you can quickly and easily retrieve it from the front end of the website. The, the next thing that we want to talk about is when you have created content and you are ready to put it out there to the world, um, you, you need to have a plan. And our next webinar is about the social media process and how you're going to be sharing your story more widely. Ultimately, we believe that the value of a story is only as, as good, essentially, as it's, it's shared commodity, as it's shared value. So what I mean by that is if you have a story, and let's say it's on a DVD, and you have that DVD sit on your shelf for 14 years and no one ever sees it, what's the value of that story if no one has ever seen it? So the beauty of social media now is that not only can you access a whole world of content that's out there for you to look at, but you can also share that content with people who have an interest in storytelling, or perhaps they have an interest in your local community or in your state. The most important thing that you can do when you're sharing your content is tag it with Be Here Main Street. What that allows us to do is to identify the content that's been created and to share it on our own social media platforms. And at MuseWeb, we have a very robust Twitter following that um, exceeds about 60,000 people who are engaged in culture across multiple cultural sectors, libraries, galleries, uh, museums, archives, universities, you name it. And those are the type of people that can really be incredibly valuable when it comes to sharing the content in turn. So you want to try to notify us, whether it's the hashtag or through a direct call out on social media that you've created this content with your students and we are very happy to share the content um, with our audiences as well. And in doing so, you do want to sort of think outside the box. You want to experiment with text and graphics and reposting content and um, the sky's the limit for what's possible with social media and we have seen some incredibly um, creative ways of engaging people through social media, whether it's uh, museums that are doing Instagram contests or Facebook Live or any of the other platforms right now um, that are, are really trying to encourage people to engage and, and comment. And ultimately, we see the value of this content and its use for sure. So share liberally and often. The content is only great if it's reused. So the next webinar is going to cover that particular topic. Exactly. And the following webinar will be on March 21st at the same time, same place, right behind your desk. At, that, at this point, I would like to 
quickly take over and ask if anyone has any questions. Feel free to unmute your microphone right now or uh, email or, or tweet at us directly. Um, we are currently a three-person team here at the Muse Web Foundation. Been talking with, uh, with me, Selwyn, and Heather just now, um, and Nancy is our executive director as well. We do try to share all these presentations either on our website directly as video links or on, uh, as well as on SlideShare. Also try to tag things with Be Here Main Street on social media, and our social media handle is at MuseWeb. And if anybody has any questions about those particular platforms and whether or not um, you find that your content that your students are creating is appropriate for one of those, please feel free to, to email us or to send us a shout out on Twitter. Um, we would be happy to answer questions and give some advice as to which platform is most suited to your content. But at the get-go, the best place to send your uh, stories is the Museum on Main Street website, and then from there we would be happy to advise. So thank you very much, and uh, we hope to hear from you on social media.